All right, so today is uh, Monday, and we are having a debate with our school board candidates. Today, the debate will be consisting of candidates Tim Fuller, Jessica Mead, Jim Schultz, Tom Zetla, Zetluka, Lukel, sorry, sir, Zetluka. <laughs> Danielle Yushka. Uh, everyone will start off by having a two minute uh, introduction, uh, and we will start the timer once I get it out. Thank you all for coming, by the way. All right. We will start with Tim. Okay. Well, I think most of you know me, but okay, when I am, I'm, I'm self-employed, I'm married, four grown children, four grandchildren, you know, very active in the community, active with the schools, and I've been on the board for three years now, and the big things what when we got on the board three years ago, there was a lot of changes that have happened. Probably the best things that's happened in these three years is I think we've made a more open board for everyone, where everyone has the information they need, and we try to, and I think we've did that well. So I just want to, you know, I've been straightforward. Not everyone has agreed with me on some of my votes and some of my positions, but I have I stick to my convictions and that's just the way I feel. So, and that's the way, it's the way I'll be. I'll vote the way I feel and I'll listen and try to give an informed decision on it. So, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Jessica? All right, I'm next. Um, I've also been on the board for three years. Um, I started in uh, 2013. And at that time when I ran, um, I ran on the platform to keep open the rural schools. Um, uh, I feel like our current board, board has um, different viewpoints, but that we've done really well to work together towards our mission. Um, and our mission is to partner with the community to provide a safe and positive educational climate that will produce our lifelong learners and um, who are able to achieve their maximum potential and contribute responsibly to our society. Um, I think that um, teaching our learners starts with the school board and I think the board has compromised and collaborated um, and we work with administration and staff to accomplish some great things in the three years that I've been on the board. So I think that um, one of the things we've done is we've upgraded the internet in the rural schools. Um, some of our students used to be bused into the city to take tests and that never um, turns out well for test scores. So we've eliminated that. And we started PBIS, which is the Positive Behaviors and Interventions and Supports. Um, that's been a great program that we've done really well with. And I'm excited for that because it's not about um, teaching our children with punishment once they have done something wrong. It's about teaching our children what are positive behaviors and how we should behave in school and in society. Because um, a lot of times they don't get those lessons at home and it's our job to fill in. And we also started a one-to-one -one technology um, plan for our students, which we have carried through and I'm very proud of that. Um, professional development for our teachers and staff um, we're working on that and we're still working on that and also the pay for performance for our teachers um, Two minutes. Is it up? Um, finish, please. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> so I think the district is headed in a great direction and I look forward to continuing this work with the board and the administration. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you? No, I'm James Schultz and uh, again uh, three years ago we ran on a platform to keep the neighborhood schools open and uh, I had uh, the reason I ran was because I things I heard and from the, the school district and different things you know it didn't add up to me and all the things that I learned while being on the school board uh, have have strengthened my convictions about the neighborhood schools being the base uh, 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 a good bedrock foundation of our community and also that they are not the problem for our our financial problems and shortfalls 
And uh, so, um, other things that we've accomplished, you know, and personally speaking, if, I, if you had proven to me that uh, the elementary schools, seven elementary schools were alone the, the reason for our financial problems, and I had concrete proof of that, I would be glad to resign and let somebody else take my place. But I feel I have conviction to run again, just to the fact of the matter that uh, these are not the cases and we have a lot of room to go. We have a lot of work to be done on what really is the problem for our uh, financial shortfalls. But uh, when we came to the school, being on the school board, uh, there were bricks falling off three elementary schools onto the playgrounds and sidewalks. And we pushed for money to be taken to take care of those uh, buildings and have them uh, fixed and have roofs put on these buildings. Uh, we were we pushed uh, for uh, a busing contract. I had asked for over three months to have that put on the agenda, and finally, when thank, thanks to Scott Jensema and uh, Jeannie Long, we were able to get on the agenda, and we were able to save over $100,000 on that school contract by having it brought up and having it looked at. And also, one of the things I'd asked I'd put in when I ran in uh, 2013 was to look for a possibility if we could get a private college into the middle school. And although I didn't succeed in that when I was looking, I couldn't find any information on uh, uh, a private college board to even ask them this question. So I called Senator Tiffany's office and Mary Sayas, and they put me in contact with the Wisconsin Econ Economic Development Corporation. And a lady named Chris Berry from Mountain White Lake called me, and uh, we were talking about different things, what I had planned on and what I was looking for. And uh, he put us in contact with a man who brought the Fab Lab to Anigo. So uh, these are some of the accomplishments that I think that were really good uh, my tenure on the board. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, Tom. Hi, I'm Tom Zat Lopel, or known locally as Tom Zat. My family is up to five generations now in the Anigo area. I've run a business on the south side of the community for about 30 years. Uh, I got involved with operation of the schools close to two decades ago when my son was in the Anawa school. I have attended virtually all board meetings, committee meetings, been on the task force, citizens committee, focus groups, uh, way too deep for any one to be. Uh, I've also campaigned for various people on the board. Three years ago I campaigned for Jim, Jessica, and Tim. So I'm kind of, uh, shouldn't even be up here because I'm running against them. But the, the point is that I believe that we have made great improvements over the last few years educationally. I believe we have a long ways to go. I believe that the board that we have now is the most receptive board to the entire community that we have had. So we are moving in the right direction. Uh, I feel that if I was elected to the board, I would be a, a very good steward for all of the children. I believe I know enough from all of these years to where my input is valid. And I do appreciate the amount of leeway the existing board has given me for the input. So I ask you for your vote, and here we go. Thank you very much. Uh, Danielle? Uh, good evening. I would like to tell you a little bit about myself and why I'm running for school board. I was born and raised on my, my family, the Meyer Family Dairy Farm in Ling Lake County, and I'm married to Eric Yushka, who is a physical therapist at the hospital. We have three small children. I have my grandmother, my parents, siblings, nieces and nephews, and many other relatives that all live in the Anigo area, and obviously my nieces and nephews are in school, so we truly are an Anigo family. I graduated from here in 1997, and I obtained my Bachelor of Science degree from UW-Green Bay in Human Biology, and I have my Master's in Nutritional Education. Previously, I was employed at Bird's Eye Foods in Green Bay in research and development, and I am currently a stay-at-home mom, and I served on the district task force committee that Tom mentioned. I believe family is very important, and I'm very fortunate to have mine around here, and I'm, I'm in a community that shares these core values and provides a good support system. I was instilled with family values and a good work ethic. I was taught to be a good listener and a problem solver using a calm voice of reason. On our family dairy farm, we had to work really hard and we had to work together. And if I'm elected, I will bring these skills to the annual school board. 
As a school board, we need to be an example of adults respectfully working together to show future generations that even though issues can be difficult, we can resolve them together. We will need to make strategic choices for the well-being of the children, the district, our community, school issues, our community issues. There will always be different points of view and we can't think in terms of winners and losers. There just has to be some give and take. And I understand that because I was raised that way. Um, I am passionate about, <laughs> I am passionate about children and their nutrition and I'd like to include that and provide um, them with a uh, I don't know. I'm dedicated, and I'll work hard, and I'm running for your family and mine. So thank you. All right, thank you, and I am Brennan Brown, and I will be the moderator tonight. Um, we will have uh, five questions displayed tonight. Um, all of them, again, two-minute responses uh, from each candidate. We will ask them individually. Everyone will get a turn. I mind you, uh, and. Our moderator or our questioners will, of course, take that as they will. Hello, my name is Ryan McCarthy. I am a I'm the student body rep one of the student body representatives to the Anaga School Board, and this is my second year having this position. So I'm pretty honored to be up here for these elections and being able to ask these questions to you guys. Um, for the first question, we've got a really heavy one about. The baby, the referendum here, and um, it is. Do you support the referendum as it stands? What do you like? And if you don't, what changes would you make? Jessica, if you would start this. Okay. So, do you support the referendum as it stands? And what would you change? Um, I do support this referendum. Um, there's been a lot of discussion around this referendum, and. The board has spent many countless evenings discussing this referendum. Um, it is such a complex, um, complex question. It's not as easy as we have to state it on the referendum. Um, I think that when I ran on keeping the rules, girl, rules, girl, rule. <laughs> schools I can't speak open um, it was important that I came in with an open mind and an open heart to see all sides of the story um, I believe that I still try to do that and you know there are schools that we are closing that are very dear to my heart Pleasant View is one um, Danielle and I rode the bus together and went to Pleasant View together and that was a great school and I think it still is a great school um, you know if I could change anything and it was perfect world, I would change that we had money to do what we wanted to do at each school and still operate it. But um, that's just not going to happen and we are not going to get more funding from the state. So I think this is a really good compromise. Um, it's a, a different direction than the previous referendum. And I think that um, it's the best we could do under all aspects. Um, there's just been a lot of talk about why a new school and why Mattoon and why Crestwood. Um, we did do a survey, so we did the work of the survey and we discussed those results, um, came up with that. Mm -hmm. There's some good points to Mattoon being in a community. Um, we save on busing because the students walk to school. Um, we're going to get broadband internet out at Mattoon. And I think that most importantly, it kind of reiterates what Danielle and I both said in our opening statements that it's a compromise and it shows our children that we are willing to invest in them and their future. And that's a good role model. Thank you. Thank you. Danielle. Well, I am personally willing to support the referendum in the spirit of compromise, but the voters will ultimately determine the outcome. Uh, you know, everyone may not agree with the structure of the referendum that the current board put together, but I, always, I find that there is value when people on both sides of an issue are willing to work together. 
you know, would I change anything? I, as it stands, I would, I would have to be a good listener and get feedback from the sources that have already been gathered before I could truthfully answer that. Um, I think compromise is a big basic negotiation process and that allows people in groups to find common ground and I feel like the current board did that and I will do my best to work with them and if it doesn't, yeah, I don't know, that's it. All right, thank you. Tim? Okay. Um, as it stands, I probably say right now I, I, I'm not going to support it for a couple reasons. The one reason I don't feel it has an equitable rural presence involved with us. It was a compromise when they voted it, when it was the, when that was approved on the board. But when I thought about it and talking to people, I just don't feel having the two single track schools out in the country and a six track school in town is feasible and then the public's not real happy with it. And then the biggest one is, I think we could have did better. I really think we could have did better on the cost. That's the biggest issue. That 25.9 million is a lot of money and it's, it's a hard one for a lot of people to swallow. You know, and it hasn't proved to me that it's gonna, as is, it's gonna save enough money to make up for the high cost. Unfortunately, we're a rural district, a lot of rural people, a lot of people that, not a lot, the income ain't real, real great, so I just don't feel it's something that's gonna go over real well, but the biggest reason is I think the cost is just a little bit too high. If we could have got the cost down a little more, I think we'd have been all right, but the way it's sitting right now, I just, I'll be honest with you, I don't feel like I can support it as it stands. Thank you. Thank you. Tom? I also do not support the referendum. When, when this whole process started, I had an idea, everyone had ideas. For many years I talked about a North and South school. As things developed, I compromised. I kept bending the direction it went. When the board made a decision of the grade breaks, that eliminated a lot of the options, really narrowed our possibilities down. So where we are now is probably the best option of the chosen grade break. The biggest reason I'm not in love with the referendum is I don't believe we've solved the rural solution because once again, I thought we should pick two schools and we should put some serious money into them. We should make them two track schools. We didn't do that. I also believe that we should have remodeled an in-town school. We, I was not in favor of any new building. We didn't do that. But the biggest reason that I've decided that, you know, and I'm not telling people what to do, but I personally will not vote for it, is that we're spending $27 million actually, and it's for 20 years. We're making a major commitment. It's very hard to pass a referendum in this town. It does not solve our financial shortfall. We have, by closing four schools, in raw numbers, we do save the million dollars that we need to save. But built back into this, we're putting in additional staff in the form of going from split uh, administrators at the grade schools to one for each, putting on another principal in the high school at $80,000, etc. So our projected savings are somewhere in the neighborhood of 600000 of the 1.1 that we're short. So here, we're going to be back to the people in a very short time, and trying to pass a second referendum is virtually zero. Thank you. Okay, I do not support the referendum. I voted against it as a school board member. Um, and the main reason I, I am against this referendum is because it does not answer the questions that we need to answer for saving money. They have presented, the, the uh, school perception surveys presented this as a, uh, the elementary schools were the reason for our financial shortfall. And when we come up with a solution for a building referendum, we were told repeatedly by the district administrator and business administrator that this will not solve our financial problems. 
And so my question is, why are we doing it? Um, we were never able, as a school board, able to answer, ask these five questions that I thought we needed. I, and uh, especially with the school board, never sat down with Myron and Bray ourselves and says, number one, what do we need? And we, we need elementary schools. You have to have elementary schools. And by law, you have to have a high school. All your schools, whether they're parochial or not, have to be connected or under the jurisdiction of a high school. So we need elementary schools, we need high schools. And the next question is, what don't we need? And the only question we come up with, what don't we need? We do not need middle schools. There's no legislature required, uh, requiring a middle school. Uh, the high school and the middle school are at half capacity or less than half capacity. And everything that's being done here in this school, 10 blocks away is being done in that school. And we have a complete duplication of services here. Uh, this school is 160,000 square feet serving 495 students. And all seven elementary schools combined together are 130 thousand square feet, 30,000 less square feet, and they serve over a thousand students. So the next question was, how will we pay for it? And uh, this referendum wants all the taxpayers to pay for it. And uh, I think the referendum, if you're going to have a referendum, you have to eliminate something that you that really eliminates costs. And so without closing the middle school, we don't have a way to pay for it other than make the taxpayers pay for it. How will it affect education? The question is, will it make it better? Will it make it worse? Uh, I don't see an improvement on this. Final, thoughts. Final comments. And the biggest problem with uh, this referendum, if, you ha if you're going to build an elementary school, it's got to be K-6 so that you can eliminate a huge building, a second high school. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. So on to the second probably biggest question of the night. If the referendum were to fail, what would you propose in its place? We'll start with Jeff. Okay. Uh, what I would propose in its place, and that's a tough question, but uh, the number one thing, if you've got to cut costs, we start moving the seventh and eighth grade into the high school. Uh, we got the room to do it, and with the, the school, school is huge. It's more than le less than half capacity, and there's plenty of room to provide a separation if you use seventh, eighth, and ninth grade as a junior high, and a tenth, eleventh, twelfth as a high school. Um, I would. My personal opinion would be to move what three, the three take the three oldest buildings in the district that are most antiquated, need the most upgrade. That's the Door Street Administration Office, the vocational building back here, and the three story elementary school over here. Uh, bring the administration into this building, close these other two buildings, and go into a building program to, to put the sixth grade back in the elementary schools. Um, this one question answers the, the biggest thing that the parents came up with. Uh, what the referendum here ignores is what the parents of elementary school age children were coming and saying about K through four. If you have most of the parents in this district have three to maybe three to four kids, you know, if you're talking about a 1,200 elementary students, you're talking about 400 parents, uh, 400 uh, family. It takes 800 parents to make that many kids with three in a family. So you're talking about 800 parents that are going to have kids that would possibly be one in an elementary school fourth grade, one in a middle school at the sixth grade, another one in the eighth grade at the high school. And so these people will have three kids in different buildings across the district, and it puts a tremendous burden upon them to be chasing around the district for these kids. And we have completely ignored what they have come to us in these meetings and asked about uh, their needs and their, their desires for the school. So um, I would do as much as possible, go to K-6, keep the kids in the elementary school situation as long as possible, and uh, go down the two uh, uh, education systems, elementary and then uh, another facility at the high school. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Tom? Last year, I campaigned on K through five in the rural schools, seventh and eighth in the high school. We utilized this building as a like seconds through fifth and to keep one of the in-town schools as an early learning center. Uh, this was one of the 30-some proposals that came forward, and the uneven grade breaks were the biggest concern and why that one went away. If you ask me what we should do if the referendum fails, I still believe we need a rural presence. I still believe that everything that we've talked about needs to be attended to. We have spent the money to have the CESA report, to have the heating and IVAC report. We have 30-some options. 
the board should take the set of options, look at a different grade break, punch through it again, see what they can find. Schools will close. I do not believe under decreasing enrollment we can keep all the schools. And I was the supporter for every one of those small schools forever. We are going to lose some schools. But I do not believe we should have wholesale slaughter of the schools just because the referendum fails. We need to go back to the drawing board and try this again. If we need to have a short-term operating referendum, so be it. We were planning to, ex to operate for at least another year to two before the new school was open. So we just sharpen our pencils and try it again. All right, thank you. Uh, Jessica? Um, if the referendum would fail, and I will make the assumption that I was on the school board again, um, I would think that the board would um, relook at grade configuration, busing, and closing schools as well. Um, I would not presume to know what answer we would come to since it was a long process to get to the answer to the referendum. Um, but I think those are important issues and I think those issues will be um, decided whether or not the referendum passes. Um, it's my opinion that the referendum would give us more options because we have already um, planned and did surveys um, of what the community is willing to support. So I think we would take a good look at that and my feeling is it would probably something be something very similar, obviously minus the new school and probably the additions to the current rural schools. So that's it. All right, thank you. Uh, Tim? Okay, if the referendum would fail, first thing as a board, we'd have to sit down with some serious conversations on what would happen. I think my thing would be, I think the eighth grade would, would, could be moved to the high school and I don't think there's an issue with that by anybody. And then with the other schools, we'd have to sit down and see where we could move them around. Unfortunately, I agree. I think you'd probably end up probably trying to find a plan to close maybe one or two of the grade schools in the end. But we'd have to look at, we'd have to look at an operating referendum and there would be in other grade configurations. I agree, we'd have to sit down as a board and discuss it and, and look at it because there'd be so many different options that would have to be taken into consideration because unfortunately, we're gonna have the shortfalls gonna be there with the budget we're gonna have to deal with. So it isn't like we have a lot of money just to go and put build on or this and that. We'd have to be very frugal and very sensible and we'd have to get together as a board. I ain't gonna say exactly what would happen. It would have to be something that the board would have to decide. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, if it fails, you know, the reality is that the difficulties we're faced with will not be going away and we'll have to work together to tr try to figure out a way to provide a quality education to our students. Um, for me personally, I mean, I, I don't have the time invested at this point, so I don't have all the knowledge, so I will have to, well, I'll take it on um, my responsibility and my priority would be to review and gather what the current board has gathered and <clears throat> try to be open, I guess, to community inf input and opinions. And try to do what's best for the community. And I just, I guess I'd be diligent in becoming um, part of the process and work very hard to do what is best for our, our children. Okay. Thank you. Okay, the next question is from, um, I will ask that one. I'm actually here as a facilitator for this, for the students, but uh, I can't help asking questions once in a while. Uh, I'm Lisa Hapes, I'm from the Annigal Journal. I've done a lot of these in the past. I know all these folks, I know most of you folks. Uh, the interesting thing, and in all the years I've been doing these questions, it always comes down to the same thing. The board, the board candidates, the board people are saying the same thing. You can't, it's very difficult to pass a referendum in this town. This town is rural, this town is poor, this town cannot 
support some of these things. Well, if you look, though, at the referendum information sheet, uh, and you compare the mill rates between Antigo and surrounding <coughs> districts, even with the referendum, if it passes, the mill rate would be 922. Without the referendum, it's 863. That is lower than Wittenberg, Burnhamwood, Merrill, <coughs> Gillett, Bowler, Crandon, Shano, Rhinelander, Tigerton, and lower than the state average. So to say this is a high spending district is not so. Rhinelander, which is also a Northwoods rural district in a lot of ways, just passed a referendum where they're giving their students $4 million a year extra. And uh, I was talking to some school people the other day and they said, can you imagine what we would do with $4 million extra dollars a year? It's, it's unbelievable, boggles the mind. So my question to each of you is, is there a lack of support for public education in this community? Is there a traditional lack of support? And if you think that there is, how do you bust through that wall and make people understand the importance of this in their town? Thank you. We're gonna start with Tom. Well, if I'm not mistaken, Lisa, you just listed a bunch of districts that were not in Lang Lake County. Lang Lake County has a $10,000 per household lower average than the state average. Uh, this is, yeah, I believe, the second or third uh, lowest income county in the state. So right off the bat, we are fighting a large difference. Some of the, the areas have a much larger tax base and they have a lot higher income. When you ask people that are, that are living on a family of three or four on $20,000 or $30,000 a year, if they can afford another $50 on their taxes, the answer is no. So we've always had that fight against it. Also, we have passed referendums. Yes, they're hard to pass, okay? Uh, We've had a lot of issues here. We've always had a problem of in town versus out of town. There is, it's, uh, there's always been, there's a, a rural to city divide that's gone back at least 90 years where the out of towners have always taken the brunt of, a, of something, their schools have been closed or whatever, felt like they were feeding the in town. Not that I'm saying that that's what's happening now, but we're talking about why we don't pass referendums. We don't pass referendums because we did a high school that was, it's a wonderful high school, but the way it came about was very traumatic. And it takes people two and a half generations to forget in this neighborhood. So there's a lot of reasons that we don't pass referendums. So educating the public, this board has done a wonderful job of of, of communicating with the public, not educating them. We've had boards in the past that gladly educated the public. Thank you. Uh, Danielle? This is tricky. <laughs> um, you know, we are at a disadvantage because from the history of like our our district, Anigo has had I can't talk now. Anigo has a history of being very frugal. And when those revenue caps were put into effect, it became unequal. And we had, we're at a disadvantage and this needs to be addressed at the state level so that we can I don't know, work it locally we need to to find a sensible way to balance the educational needs of the children and in our district with the abilities of our taxpayers. But if we're struggling financially and then we don't get the support from the state, it makes it difficult. I think we're, we get approximately like 60% of state aid and around 30% in tax levies. And these fluctuate and I just feel we're at a disadvantage and somehow, um, I mean, the state, that has to be addressed at the state level and I don't know, continue to work together with the board or with the community like the board has. All right, thank you very much. 
Uh, on that slip there, though, Lisa, while well, Bino's about two dollars lower than I, that's the kind of district I'd probably like to live in if I was had to, you know, a lot of property and was paying taxes. But <laughs> anyway, my daughter Sarah is a third year senior at Concordia College, and last semester she had a research paper she had to do, and so she did it on. Uh, demographics of school districts and she picked the 10 states that had higher test scores in Wisconsin and 10 states that had lower test scores in Wisconsin and in her research of, and exhaustive research of all these school districts she did not find any correlation between high academic performance test scores and demographics in other words if you had a city here that had a elementary school middle school and high school and had high test scores you had another city over here that had a elementary middle school and high school and had low test scores uh, administration, you know, the, the board is supposed to look over administration. I'm not, I don't want to beat up on administration. I just want to, they, there's a philosophy, there's a tendency for administration to want to institutionalize everything. And you say, we, can, we got these kids in a box over here, but if we take these kids out, of, out and put them in this box, they'll do better. And just because we have a middle school, just because we have multi-track schools does not mean we will improve education. As a matter of fact, there's no evidence to that whatsoever. The two driving forces for higher education is parental participation and your professional staff. Now, in this school district with our little elementary schools, we have a lot of participation in our small elementary schools. And where the resistance here is that we keep trying to take away these schools from the parents. We, they keep, I keep, all my life I've heard people tell me they've moved to this district because of these elementary schools. Just in the last meeting, in the February committee meeting, had a uh, lady tell us, I picked, we picked this house because of this school. And, you know, I hear that all the time. So. The next thing is you're, you're, you get your per parental participation. When I worked in this district, I, I took a job in Wausau. I got a bunch more money to work in Wausau. And that's, you know, why would I go to Wausau? Because I get more money over there doing the same thing. Uh, okay. Um, and the point was, whenever I told somebody in this district I was on the school board, the first thing that I, most c common response was, oh, they told us this school was toxic. It wasn't fit to be a school for kids. They couldn't be in this school. We had to build a new building. And as soon as they got to build a new building they oh we can fix it so there's a lot of animosity about that and we gotta restore that kind of thing with and uh working with the people to get their participation in this and let them know that we're, we're working with them you know not just taking something away from them okay thank you thank you thank you Tom? Oh, my bad. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. No, you see, no, I, I agree. I think there is a lot of local support out there in our community and stuff. I think the biggest issue isn't that the people don't want to support it. It's the proposals we're putting out there. Sometimes we're not getting, you know, unfortunately, our district is so diverse and large. It encompasses so much rural area, city area, and we got this. You know, there's, there's still, unfortunately, there's still some of that rural city divide. It's still there. You know, they want someone, someone and everything in town, someone and all in the country and stuff. And we have to work. So I think there's a lot of support out there for education because people are willing to help out with everything. I think we just have to try to find the right idea to match the people out there. I don't think it's that the people ain't willing to pay for it. I think they are for the right for the right proposal. I just don't think we've come up with the right proposal for the people out there. I think the local local supports education. Everyone you talk to, you know, is for and stuff. I just think we need to try to come up with a way to encompass the ideas of what the public would like. And that's where I think we've failed. It isn't that the local won't support the schools. I think there's a lot of local support for our public education. But I think we have to find the right proposal for them. Thank you. That's good. Thank you. <clears throat> Jessica. Okay. <clears throat> um, I guess you can look at the glass as half full or half empty. Um, I do think that there is a great support for education in this community. I do think there is also a portion on a fixed income. We have an aging uh, community. And there is a good portion of people who do not have children or grandchildren in the schools and have a hard time with my taxes are gonna rise and I don't have kids. So I think it's really important for the school board to educate the public on how uh, intertwined um, the health and um, thriving of our community is with our schools and our education. 
and I think you do that by empowering people. Um, our PBIS program is a great one. There's great um, resources on that online. There's things for families. There's things for students. Um, when you start there and you start with our children, then it just grows. They become great members of our community. They come back to our community. Um, and even if they don't, we support that because we support the best for our children, which is what we always want for children. So I think that's what you can do to um, try and break through for the lack of support. All right, thank you very much. Okay, let's move on to a question. Let's get off the referendum. Uh, you guys are tired of talking about the referendum. Uh, let's talk about the uh, conflict that might exist, maybe not in this school district, between extracurricular areas. Uh, you have a very thriving arts program here, extracurricular arts, that's very evident in the drama program. If you look, we have three students once again this year uh, that are going to be kids from Wisconsin. That says a lot for a little school, a little town like this in a little district. At the same time, you have a very thriving athletic program. So you have a hockey team that just went to state. Everybody in the world, if they're not dead or dumb, is watching the NCAA and seeing Wisconsin, seeing all these things move on. I'm wondering if you think that the arts and athletics get a fair amount and an equitable amount of the school budget dollars, how you think that they can be balanced between you know, the traditional academics and, and uh, supporting some of these areas that are so important to students and so important to our community. Uh, Danielle, what do you say? Great. <laughs> I don't have a lot of knowledge and um, the amount of dollars that they receive educate you know towards athletics and the arts I think they're both very important and I think all of our children should have the opportunity to participate in extracurricular activities uh, there's many experiences and life experiences that are associated with them and I think our community has always been good at supporting them um, so I don't, I don't know how to speak to the fair amount of educationally because I don't know what they receive I guess and I mean we have the gridiron club that supports football and blue line for hockey and we have fantastic band booster clubs and the I mean Bye Bye Birdie was excellent and they did a wonderful job and could they use more money to support them maybe um, is the amount fair? I'm not sure, but I would definitely have to look into it. And I'm proud of, of our children in both the arts and the athletics and hope we can fund them and can hope to continue funding them. All right, thank you. Uh, Tom, we're going to go on to you. Well, first of all, the two do not compete. You will have some kids are going to gravitate toward athletics, some will gravitate toward band, whatever. Some will be in all, some will be in none. We have over the years stripped every dollar we can out of these programs because we didn't have the dollars. We have the booster clubs who support us. It's, uh, we, we have people giving money to help pay offset for busing for the events. So we have stripped so much out of programs because we've been constantly short of dollars. So when you say, how do you balance these for education, the less money we have, the further we have to get back to just the core. Is the core going to make the most rounded students? No, of course not. And we want to have all of these advantages. Jim had said a little while ago about um, there wasn't a co correlation to dollars and student achievement. And I'm sure there is some, but I, I tend to agree with him. There was just, just a story the other night about St. Boniface, which is in the one of the worst neighborhoods in New York City. They're graduating, right their high school of 600 kids are graduating 98%. What's more importantly, is they're getting an 80% graduation rate from college of their students afterward, and they have no money. They're doing their kids on $12,000 per year. So 
they have, there's, there are districts that have found, there are schools that have found ways to work on, on the funding, uh, to do more with the, with the limited dollars. So I, I believe that, you know, we are in a rock and a hard place. We want to support every program we can. We have to quit cut, cutting programs. We, you know, the, the board, this, the last, the new board for the last three years has worked very hard to improve programs, not yes, cut anymore. So, we're, we know, we're just going to have to do the best we can, and I, I believe that every program deserves its right to exist. Thank you very much. Jessica. Um, as someone who majored in college in fine arts, I would definitely be for the arts. Um, <laughs> I think it's just a balancing act because, you know, funding is less and less, and I think, um, when we talked about earlier about support for education, I think this is where a lot of support for education comes in, in all different areas. Our community is great about pulling together to support those, um, like we had mentioned, like the Gridiron Club and um, a lot of, just all throughout the district, I see a lot of support from various community members. Um, we even had some of our local business members help out with the Bye Bye Birdie, I know that. Um, so I think we will have to try to do more with less. I think that's just a reality of it. And I am always a supporter of the extracurricular programs in arts because I think those are um, very valuable and just another piece of the picture for our students' education. All right, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Jim? Okay, I probably got a little different view. I feel we should probably find a way to put a little more money into the arts and the athletics and stuff because what I found out with the kids over the years and stuff, okay, my kids were involved in extracurriculars, sports and stuff like that. And the group of kids they hung with, it seemed like they all did better. They worked harder, they worked as a team. I think it's an important part. Every time they make it, it seems like when there's a budget cut all the time, it's always the extra, whether it's the music program, art, athletics they're always the one that's always the first that everybody wants to strip everything out of but i think for a lot of kids that's a very important part of their education because you know like you say you know yes a kid should be in the classroom for eight hours you know and stuff but if you take the kid a lot of the kids and force them in a classroom and don't let them do any extracurriculars you know where their grade point average is going to go they need this and I just feel if we, I know it's hard with budgets and stuff. If we could, if at all we find a way, I think we'd be better. The kids would like it. I think they'd be, you'd see improvements in grades and stuff. If we could have more involvement and a little more, try to get more money into it. I know it's hard to do, but I just feel it would be very important. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, bricks, mortar, concrete, steel, and things like that, blacktop don't educate anybody. Um, uh, we'd have to take a, we need to take a good look at the building configurations that we got we got excess buildings where they can be they can be uh, actually uh, consolidated where it would actually save us money instead of making us spend another 26 million dollars for more brick mortar and concrete and not get a penny's worth of education out of it so if we if we actually cut what we really don't need there's money available to support all the arts and athletics that we need and I am a big supporter of, of arts and athletics so we voted on the board to keep the uh, music teacher for the fifth grade. There, there was a lot of people that came up and stood up for that, and I, I was for that. And uh, uh, everybody wants to make, when they, when they don't, when if referendums fail, things like that, they want to use arts and athletics as a way to, to kind of beat people over the head and say, we're going to cut these programs if you don't uh, come up with more money or something like that, or if you don't pass this referendum well. Uh, like I said, I think what, like Tim says, we need to take the proposal to the public that they will back that will show that we're cutting uh, unneeded costs and uh, and put it into the education facilities and into the, into the people and the professional development that will bring education to the people. And that's what hands-on, it's the teachers hands-on in the room that are bringing the education to us, not the, not the box over here, not the box over there. So that's uh, my take on that, thank you. Thank you very much. One last question before closing statements. All right, so um, currently the Annabelle High School contracts some of the business classes out to the NTC to make up for a teacher we lost this past year, and it's now taking place in 
like online co uh, courses and stuff. Um, do you believe this is a good way to educate our students, and would you expand upon it? Why or why not? Okay. Unfortunately, I think it. I think it is because sometimes we realistically you'll have a couple students that want to go to this, you know, business um, venture or whatever. And we, as a district, with budgets and stuff the way it is, we can have a teacher here strictly for a couple students. So sometimes we have to do some outsourcing. I mean, I'm all for it. if we could at all find a way to keep them in and work it with another teacher or something that can do it here, it would be great. But I think sometimes, I don't think there's any choice in the matter because these kids should have the opportunity. And if we can't give it to them here, they should be able to go to the tech school or wherever and get get these classes that they, they need to take. Unfortunately, it would be great if we didn't have to outsource anything, if we could keep everything here. But realistically, I think some things just have to be so the kids, because some kids, that's the only way they're going to get the opportunity. Otherwise, they're not going to have the opportunity to take these classes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, Jessica. Um, the students, I think benefit as well. I mean, they're not unsupervised. It's, you know, there's still coursework that they have to do. Um, and I think it allows us to give them more opportunities and more expertise by um, collaborating with the NTC. We collaborate with them on um, several different things. And this is just a new one that we've started recently. And um, I would like to see expansion upon it too. I'm. I'm curious to see the feedback on how it went after the school year, but I think that would be um, something that keeps up with today's world because in all reality there's a lot of meetings that go on over Skype and um, learning and collaboration as well, so I would um, support it. I think wherever there is another facility that's already staffed and already built that, that uh, we can outsource to in the community. I think that's an excellent resource. Uh, uh, ex ex the, the NTC probably had the staff is a little bit, maybe, uh, you know, I don't know, but uh, I would just say any kind of college, any kind of online college or anything like that would have a little bit higher end staff there. The kids would be able to get a little better uh, uh, take on things, possibly. Uh, I do, you know, we need to do everything inside our school district to improve our education, but Definitely, if we can uh, outsource things that are already existing, where people set up a specialty program or something like that, we have a specialty knowledge, a specialty training in that, uh, our kids can only benefit from that. Um, I have an uncle and aunt in Fox, and I talked to them a couple weeks ago, and they had a son that uh, graduated second in their class. He went to MIT in Minnesota, Minneapolis Institute of Technology, and he said when he went there, um, he was way behind. There was kids there that were semesters ahead of him. Uh, and they were kind of upset that they heard that, you know, that we were kind of behind. I mean, we're not really bad. We're not really on the bottom of the pile, but there's so much that we can do better and uh, there's so much we need to do better. And I, ha I hear this from different other people too. Uh, uh, I had to go to a next door business in Wassa there and I talked to the secretary and she found out she's from Antigo and uh, she had her high school student uh, was given books to read that in the other school, that district they were in, had uh, read those books in the fifth grade. So. Um, you know, whatever it takes for us to get better, to do better, to get more professional staff, then we need to do that. We need to upgrade. We need to get up as, as best we can and make anything available to our students that will give them a step up and improve their education. Thank you very much. Danielle? Well, I, I personally do feel it is good to utilize the NTC and any other resources we have in our community to educate them. Um, if the students can get credit for these classes, and the district maintains overview of them. And then they can go ahead and in talking to my niece, they can use some of these credits towards college. And I think that's wonderful because they'll be able to save money down the road. Um, the training provides skills that will allow our students to remain living and working in our Antigo area, like the um, medical term terminology, nursing, CNA, woodworking, welding, so those are all very important to our community and they speak to the future of our area so the bottom line is if they collectively serve the parents and our, the children and the district I think they're a good thing. Okay, thank you. It's the 21st century 
I remember when we had a party line on the telephone. Now phones, and they're little bitty square things. The kids, this is their generation, and each one's going to be moving further ahead into technology. When we say outsourcing, yes, we could talk to other physical buildings, such as the tech school, and that's very good. But the future is going to be online. We can specialize, we can get those classes that we need for low student counts and for different groups that we will never be able to afford to have the educator come in for. Now, I'm not saying that we should shut all the doors to the buildings and turn into a virtual uh, entity. We do need to have the social interactive, the programs. We're going to have a bunch of programs. But at the same time, we can expect as time goes by to have more and more online. You're going to see less of, of, of what we know as traditional education. The whole thing is transforming. It's transforming rapidly. So we should embrace, a credit, of course, accredited, of course, uh, that we make sure it's in our best advantage because there's trash out there. But just the cost of a textbook program is so high that we can look at more individualized learning for all levels. We've moved from, from having rows of kids in a class teaching the same to individualized learning right now. This is the future. So I do not see why we would ever want to uh, resist from using other sources. Uh, Michigan State did a entry-level physics program and they hope to have 10,000 people sign up for it. They got 100,000. The future is online. Thank you. So now, before we close, we're going to have each uh, candidate is going to have two minutes to have a closing statement, and we're just going to go right down the line, starting with you, Jim. Okay. Um, in closing, uh, the future of Antigo High School District, I would like to see on the school board the school board itself go back to uh, uh, abandon our governance uh, level of, of school board, right? We do, what, we, what we do right now, giving the district administrator full reign over everything. I'll go back to the committee based school board where we can uh, uh, go to five or six different committees. And I just use one for an example. The reason I want to do this is there's so much information that as a school board member, I have no clue what's going on inside these buildings. And a good example of that is curriculum. We get reports from the different building principals and things like that, and we hear that they're, they're working hard, they're making improvements here and there, you know, but I also hear grandparents from uh, uh, two grandparents, one, each after, one year after the other, two separate families. They said their fifth grader coming out of uh, elementary school couldn't do math. And uh, so I, I say, okay, we're making progress in the school, but on the, on the other side of it, they, they can't do math. And I don't know, I don't have the answer for that. Why can't they do math? What, 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 are, what kind of math are they teaching? For example, then I'd like to see a, a committee, a, a school board committee of curriculum with a sub base committee of s parents and, and retired people, whoever, private citizens in the community that would be uh, reading these books, reading our curriculum, studying it, and giving a report up to the school board so we get, uh, gather a whole lot more information, more interaction between not just the school board and the administration, but the school board, the administration, and the people that are actually uh, in the community. And they would know then what we're, what, what's being taught, and we could, if there's a, an area that, we, that could be recommended to improve, the, well, then we could take that up. And that way we'd get into the actual education of it more than other things. We need to be the board of education, for the last 10 years, we've been the board of referendums, the board of consolidation, the board of construction firms, welfare and, and banker. Uh, one, this, this, if this referendum passes, we're going to have $1.1 million a year of debt service. Thanks. It'll be very uh, lucrative to the bank. So we really need to get need to back to basics of serving the people and serving education, number one. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I would like to thank you, the moderators, and Lisa, and everyone um, who has helped put this on tonight and for allowing me the opportunity to participate. I, um, I have a lot to learn, but I am a passionate person, and I truly care about the children in our district and our community, and I just, I will do the best job I, I possibly can, and I'll be dedicated to finding the best solutions that best help our children in our community. 
and thank you. Um, I would like to be reelected to the board because I want to see our current progress continue and I would like to see some of the things that we have started through. Um, I have compassion for all students. I think of all the students as my own and um, I think it is hard when you still see your students tr struggle um, and you see some of the things that are not so positive that happen in our district. Um, but we have a great team of the board, the administration, and the staff. And um, they are very strong. They're working to be even stronger to support our children in becoming great learners and guiding our children. And I envision the day when people will say, Annieville School District, I want my kids to go there. And I think that begins with trust and open minds and open hearts um, and encouragements, not criticisms. And I promise to do this if I'm reelected. And so I ask for your vote. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um. The school board has an incredible responsibility. It's a thankless job and they take all of the abuse for when things go wrong. The board that we've had over the last couple of years has been the most diverse board. We've made great, great educational improvements. There's a long way to go educationally. The, there's many things that can be done regardless of our brick and mortar problem. The, the staff, especially our teachers, they've, they've struggled greatly over the changes that have just come about. Uh, and it's gonna take a while to embrace them, but I do believe we are making great improvements for our students over where we were just a few years ago. A school district is a large governmental entity. So change works on a geologic scale. The change that's been happening around Anago has taken not just people you see on this on the board, it has taken people from outside of the board uh, and have pushed hard. You know, I've made, I've made some good friends, I've made some good enemies because I have pushed hard for many years for change, always for better education. Now, being a realist, I look at the fact that, you know, we can talk about changing the revenue cap, it's out of our control. We can write all the letters we want, it's out of our control. We're stuck with a lot we have on life. We have to make the best we can of it. So we, we do need to find a solution that gets us on a sustainable level. Uh, I don't think we're there with the current referendum. It's a real shame. I really, really wanted this to be Lastly. the solution. So uh, if you decide you'd like me on the board, I will continue to work my tail off for those kids. I will work for them if I'm not on the board. So I ask for your vote. Thank you much. Thank you. Okay, yes, I would appreciate everyone's vote to get back on the board, because like I said, I've been on the board three years. And like you said, it's a learning experience. And I'll tell you, every meeting is something new and you're always learning. If you think, I was probably a little naive when I got on the board at first because I thought I'd come in and you could make this change and that change and just like this, only it doesn't work that way. There's a learning and like I said, I got every week, it's every t board meeting, every time you talk to somebody or, or if somebody calls you, a parent or somebody calls you about something, it's a constant learning and that's where you have to be open and willing to listen and stuff and you know, and there's been you know, through the three years, you know, there's been with great teachers, staff, you know, the administration, they've all been great to work with because we, they're the ones that got the hard job. You know, yes, we sit in the meetings and make some of these decisions and stuff, but they got to deal with these kids every day, you know, and that's where it comes down to. The most important thing out there is these kids. For me, if you want to say what's the best time in the last three years, I'd say is when you get to go to graduation as a board member and you can stand up on stage and hand that diploma card to that and shake their hand or give them a hug, you know, that they've, this kid has become an adult, you know, has learned so much. And that's what this is important about. And that's why I want your support to keep, so we can keep going for that. All the rest is, yeah, you got buildings, this and that, 
the money and all these issues will always be there. But what we have to remember is it comes down to the kids. That's what it matters. Thank you. Thank you. And of course that ends it all. So thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm sure these guys up here appreciate it as well. But I'm pretty sure we can all agree that everybody should go out and vote on April 5th. Thank you. Good job.